Hi everyone, my name is Stefan Wiefling and I'm from the HBRS University for Applied Sciences and this is joint work together also with uh, HBRS people Johannes Kuhnke and Luigi Loyakono and we also have Markus Ullmann here uh, who is from the Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnik which is like the NIST in the US and the NCSC in the UK and we're just talking about uh, passwords actually, although we have a different title here. Um, Passwords are just deployed on all the websites worldwide, which is like a standard authentication scheme. All the websites have it, but we, all the websites have weaknesses uh, that are just quite evolving all over the last years, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic. Because um, just imagine you have password databases, you steal these password databases, and now you can just automatically enter these ones on other websites and since we're just reusing passwords across websites I pick guilty in that as well uh, these credential stuffing attacks have just uh, increased all over the last years actually and um, the problem is here yeah if you don't have additional measures here um, we can uh, we get we still have problems just uh, take a look at our risk-based authentication talk which will be at the next day of passwords con if you're just interested in that one um, another attack that is also involving is uh, password spraying so you can take some passwords and um, and usernames and you can just uh, test a lot of uh, standard passwords across uh, different la large type of users so these type of attacks are also quite successful um, besides that you can also use machine learning to guess passwords more efficiently um, I just see uh, like uh, all the year there are new papers upcoming who are just uh, developing new techniques in order to uh, bypass passwords or guess passwords more efficiently with machine learning. So this is a threat that also increased here over the last years. And besides that, there's a classical phishing one. So you can basically just trick uh, people into revealing their passwords like with social engineering and so on. So this is still a threat and uh, it's not going away with passwords because the problem with passwords in general is when someone reveals the secret, which means the password to get into your account, and then the whole password scheme is broken. So uh, yeah, how can we actually solve this problem? Yeah, perhaps uh, imagine what about uh, if we just replace the password with a security key? Yeah, seems like a good idea because then we could get rid of all the problems that we know about passwords uh, because it just works like a, a door lock that you might know from at home. Um, you just get into your user account only if you uh, enter your security key into your computer or tap it on your smartphone. And uh, only then you get in because also the browser checks if it's a phishing site or the original website. So there's an additional security measure that passwords can't provide by themselves. Um, so it seems like a good idea, right? Yeah, but in reality, it's more difficult. Um, because if you just take a look at some studies that have just uh, taken or have been just taken on uh, pass, uh, passwordless authentication, so not requiring a password, but just requiring the security key to signing in, um, they the participants that were just uh, testing these schemes, they in principle liked it, but they had a problem uh, with regaining access because uh, they were more afraid of losing access to their accounts than to getting hacked. That's a big problem because, um, yeah, <laughs> um, what if we just lose our security key? And that's still an unsolved problem right now. So uh, what we see from these studies is that we uh, that it is very important for the users to still uh, regain their access to the accounts. And if you just lose your key, you will not get access at all. And uh, you probably have a problem with the support of the website and so on. So there's a very high priority to users, um, but there's not a standardized procedure right now in order to regain access. Um, but this is still important, so we need to solve it from somehow. The FIDO Alliance, so the company that also has a standard for the security keys, um, they just issued um, a paper, a white paper, which just recommends to register a second authenticator. So just using a backup uh, security key to regain, still regain access. But uh, if you just take a look at that one, um, it's still a very high burden for users because you need to register 
all the two security keys that you have here for um, every website you're using. So if you're like uh, someone who uses 100 accounts, um, it will ver be very, very difficult to replace the key on all the websites. And you still need to remember actually on which websites you actually used it, um, this, these two keys. So it's a very, very high burden just to do that. So uh, we thought about uh, what are actually alternatives to that one or what kind of uh, recovery mechanisms do we have in literature. And based on that, we did an analysis and uh, we will present you the results of our studies. Um, what did we found actually? We had uh, 12 account recovery mechanisms that we just found just by uh, doing a lot of literature research, uh, finding them on popular online services and also doing uh, some a lot of Googling research um, you can just take a look at the original paper just if you are interested in how we just figured it out. But at the end, we had 12 account recovery mechanisms that could also be used with passwordless to uh, FIDO2 authentication. Um, based on these ones, what are actually the ones that we found here? There were like six um, that are actually deployed in practice. So uh, yes, there are security questions here. This is also a mechanism that was there, uh, like one-time password. So you uh, just get a key, um, a security token somehow sent to your mobile phone and so on. Um, also like delegated account recovery or the advanced protection program, which I'm just going to present you afterwards, are also in our set. And there are still uh, six uh, other mechanisms that were just uh, deployed, not deployed in practice, but we just found them in literature and they could be quite interesting to take a look at. For example, uh, like online recovery storage or uh, anything else. I'm just going to tell you afterwards. And um, so these 12 account mechanisms that we just found here, we just analyzed them on uh, a lot of heuristics that we just found in practice. So um, you can just take a theoretical look at all the mechanisms and figure out if they fulfill certain criteria. And this criteria is frequently cited in uh, literature. So we took these ones um, and uh, we had four categories uh, of these um, heuristics and uh, characteristics that we just analyzed our schemes at. First of all, of course, usability is very important because uh, the more the user tend to accept it, uh, the higher uh, we will have uh, adoption of passwordless authentication. So memory-wise, effortless, do we need to remember a secret? Um, can we scale it actually for user? Do we need to um, do register it on all the websites and a lot of registering or is it just, uh, is it just handleable for user user? Do you need to carry a device? Um, do you need to do additional work to make this uh, happen? Or, and can you actually learn that scheme? So these are actually the usability metrics. Um, regarding deployability, it's also important for service owners. Um, so is it like an accessible scheme? Uh, do you have a high cost if you want to integrate a user into your system? Is it compatible with a lot of browsers? Because um, if you don't have compatibility, compatibility uh, of browsers, you might still have a problem here. Um, is it an open scheme that is not proprietary or is it still an implemented scheme or is it not happening right now? Um, these are the deployability ones. You also have, of course, uh, since we're at PasswordsCon, talking about security. So how secure is the scheme? And based on the criteria, the scheme must be resilient against a lot of attacks like uh, observation, people observing you, um, people who try to impersonate you, um, people that just are a man of the in the middle attacker, for example. Um, what happens if uh, a verifier that we're using is leaking data um, or phishing, of course, or if someone steals um, your security mechanism uh, is also important. And uh, in addition, uh, do we need an explicit consent um, to like pushing a button or something in order to proceed with the authentication. Is it an open mechanism? Can we verify it um, with public sources? Um, the work factor, how much work do we actually need to do um, uh, in order to break the scheme? How much work is needed? Um, and so on. And regarding privacy, uh, we also have like, uh, do we have a third party that we need to trust here um, or not? 
um, and is it also unlinkable to any person or is it linkable? Um, so these are a lot of metrics actually, uh, but we um, actually then um, analyzed our schemes based on these metrics. And uh, these are our results. Um, first of all, there were some uh, account recovery mechanisms that we deemed not usable for passwordless uh, password um, FIDO2 authentication, which are like security questions here. It never worked for passwords, so they probably don't work for uh, FIDO2. Um, we also had like, um, like backward some ones that are also based on knowledge, but since we want to get rid of passwords, they don't make sense here. Um, like let's authenticate or uh, using a backup password. Um, this doesn't work here. In our opinion, we also had other schemes like delegated account recovery that is um, like in the beta version at Facebook. Uh, this works as follows. We have a user here. We have an online service. So the online service that we want to deploy the scheme on. And we have a recovery provider um, who wants to, uh, yeah, want to re-authenticate us. So how does it work? Um, you as a user just uh, register at the online service itself. And in this case, the online service just deposit uh, a recovery token at the recovery provider uh, to make this work. And what happens if we just lose our access? Uh, in this case, we um, want to ask our online service, hey, just recover my account. In this case, the online service just redirects us to the recovery provider that we have here. And at the end, um, we authenticate with the recovery provider. And if that's a successful authentication, uh, in this case, we're just getting back um, our the, the recovery provider just sends back the recovery token to the online service. And if that's the correct token, then we're just getting uh, back our user account at the end. But if we just take a look at the scheme, it did not perform well based on our criteria. We just only had five of 23 criteria fulfilled uh, because you also need to trust a third party provider and so on. So um, it doesn't uh, perform well. Um, it's also similar to the um, Advanced Protection Program by Google. It's kind of like similar, um, performed worse. Uh, and also the problem is here that it's not an open scheme. We don't know exactly what they're doing in the back end, so we cannot really verify uh, if it works. And we really need to trust the recovery provider 100%. And if it doesn't work, you probably um, have a bad scheme here. So it did not really perform in our evaluation. Um, but however, uh, we can still have other mechanisms that we just evaluated. An idea that was also proposed in literature was uh, like copying keys between mobile devices. So you have two mobile devices which store FIDO2 access keys. And these private keys are also exchanged here. Um, first of all, that works quite uh, intuitive for users, but the problem is here, uh, of course, Someone should have noticed that. Um, the private key leaves the authenticator and this just um, violates the basic principle for authenticators never leave the authenticator as a private key because then other third parties can copy it. And it also relies on an owner identification service. Um, so at the end, uh, this is also not uh, a very good mechanism that we have here. And it's also not that scalable because uh, users also have to initiate the key copy mechanism all the time. So um, this is not something that works here. Uh, but since I just showed you the bad practices, maybe it's important to get the best results here. And um, one of the best results that we had here is, yes, it's the backup token. Um, the mechanism that we wanted uh, to check out if it works uh, other ones as well. Uh, backup token uh, fulfilled a lot of criteria, but it still has a very high cost per user because you have to, uh, first of all, buy a second authenticator. And uh, this is a problem here because, you know, uh, a YubiKey is not that cheap. And if you just need to buy two ones, I think a lot of us will um, cancel the mechanism. 
Uh, what could be solved by it is actually quite interesting because we have uh, the German Personalausweis. So uh, the German ID card has an integrated FIDO2 token, which is a hidden feature. They did not document it uh, publicly, but there was an online blog that just figured that out. Um, and in this case, it, uh, it's quite useful for some users because you just need to buy one authentication token and you already have your second one, uh, your German ID card. Uh, but the problem is here, um, first of all, it's hard to learn because um, it's not integrated, it's not. Uh, it's just a hidden function, so no one actually knows about it. I don't know if the German people in the audience have noticed it, that this is really integrated into their ID card. And um, also because we have a linkability here, because we have the ID card, um, it, it's possible to re-identify some users, so um, we expect that um, users likely reject that mechanism because I don't know if you want to register your FIDO2 token or your ID card on all online services, so it's likely not the best mechanism here. Uh, besides that, we have some promising approaches here that uh, could be quite uh, interesting for future research. Um, these are just not deployed in practice, but uh, they have been stated in literature um, one of them is the online recovery storage. So we have a primary and a backup uh, key here, a backup security key here. And we have an online recovery storage, which is in, on the internet. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, first of all, um, our backup authentication key uh, sends a lot of, um, generates a large number of public keys and the security token just signs it back. So in this time, uh, we have a proof of ownership. So um, the backup token can prove, yes, uh, this is, uh, I know the other primary security key and the primary security key can prove that, um, that they had a connection somehow. And uh, both security keys then just register with the online recovery storage. And uh, what is happening next is that we just register at the online service with our primary uh, authentication key. And the online recovery storage now acts as the second uh, recovery uh, backup authentication key and also registers on the online service. So the online service does not know anything about our personal backup authentication key. But what happens if we just lose the access to our uh, authentication key? Uh, in this time, uh, we introduce a new primary authentication key. And uh, we just repeat the same procedure here. So sending a lot of public keys from the backup token. And the uh, pri new primary token just signs these keys back. And um, so we have a proof of ownership here again. And uh, then the just... The new, uh, the new replaced to re be replaced device just registers at the online recovery storage, and the recovery storage now can trace back um, the whole chain of uh, signed keys. So in this time, they know okay, we have a connection here. This is really a valid key because it was signed by the device that knows the other device, and this time uh, we can replace the uh, now lost authenticator on our online service. So this mechanism is quite scalable because we just need to register uh, one device at a time in our online service so we can scale it on online on other online services. Um, and it's also unlinkable because um, the online recovery storage used a privacy wrapping key. Um, the problem is here, uh, it, it manipulates a little bit of the FIDO2 standard because they're using an additional protocol that's uh, something that has not been integrated into the FIDO2 standard right now and we require still a trusted third party. So if we don't trust the recovery storage, the online recovery storage, our scheme will not work. Another mechanism that works offline is the preemptive syncing mechanism. So we have also our two keys again. Uh, we have the same procedure as before. So sending a lot of public keys and signing them. So we have a proof of ownership. And um, now our primary authentication key just registers at the online service, and that's it. And if we're just losing this uh, primary authenticator, we still have the same procedure. So introducing a new primary authenticator, um, sending a lot of public keys, uh, which are again signed. And then we can just register at the online service again. 
just with that new authenticator and our online service just recognizes, yes, um, this must be the new authentication key so we can replace the old one because all the chain uh, of public keys has been signed before. So we have the proof of ownership again so we can replace uh, the old with the new primary authenticator at the end. Um, so what we just recognize here is a scalable mechanism like the old one, but it works offline. So um, it's also unlinkable because it does not change anything on the final two standard. Um, it's browser compatible because it's still the FIDO2 standard and uh, we don't require a third party. So this is a very, very promising scheme, uh, but it still requires further research because it has not been deployed in practice right now. But uh, in our opinion, it looks quite promising here to take a closer look at it. So just to conclude, um, we still find that there's not the perfect recovery solution yet. None of these schemes that we tested was seen as, uh, yeah, topping it all. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. But what we found is that the preemptive syncing mechanism looks quite promising because it works offline. And uh, yeah, it could be an idea just to uh, yeah have a scalable mechanism that does not require to register two tokens and on all the websites. So uh, that could be interesting for anyone in the FIDO um, standardization um, consortium um, who works on that uh, to consider it for further research. Um, and also an idea is to have the transfer access protocol integrated in the FIDO2 standards if we want to uh, think about the online recovery storage. But uh, this is just an idea. I'm not an expert in that and perhaps it still has flaws because it has not been tested yet. So um, yeah, it, uh, but as we can see, it's a very promising topic here of passwordless FIDO2 um, authentication and account recovery here. So uh, yeah, if you just got any questions, we're doing research on that one. Um, just check us out or just drop me a line. I'm on Twitter as well. And our research group is also reachable here. So uh, just take a look at it. And uh, yeah, I'm very looking forward to your questions. And uh, thank you very much to watching our talk. So thank you very much and bye. <laughs>